My name is Deanna. For those, thank you. This is my new assistant. Let me do a good job. My name is Deanna, for those of you who haven't met me before. And as you may or may not know, I serve as the chaplain at Eden Medical Center. So I'm there four days a week, Tuesday through Friday. If you are ever there, or if you ever have a loved one who's there and would like prayer or a visit, just an encouraging word, please just tell them. Have the nurse or the team call the chaplain. It would be my privilege to be with them. Now, people often ask me, how do you do it? Be in the hospital with people who are sick all the time. And I'm often with people who are dying. And my answer is, with a lot of help from my friends. With a lot of help from my friends. And today I'm going to be sharing some thoughts with you about the big rock friends. In the process, you know I love stories, I'm going to share two stories with you. One about a new friend of mine, Aaron, and the other about a very dear friend of mine, Jesus. Now, as I've been preparing for this message, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time to the translator, um, this ditty has been ringing in my head. Now, some of you know the first verse I'm going to sing, but if you only watch the TV show that you already know is one of my favorites, you don't know the second verse because they don't play this in the opening. But this has been ringing in my head as I think about friends. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true, you're a pal and a confidant. And when we both get older, with walking canes and hair of gray, have no fear, for even though it's hard to hear, I will stand real close and say, thank you for being a friend. I love that show. And I love my friends. Now, in addition to that song, we also have to be, you know, rather spiritual because we're here in church today. I've also been meditating on John 15, verses 12 through 14, which reads, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. The two key words that jump out to me in that scripture are friends and love. And they're linked together by the word do. Friends and love linked together by the word do. And that brings me to the title of my message today, Friends Do what love does. Friends do what love does. So, friends of God, pray with me. Gracious and loving God, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word with your people and to share your word with people who might be interested in getting to know you a little bit better. So today, God, I just pray that you would prepare every heart that's within the sound of my voice and that you would share with them whatever they need to know about you and the friendship that you so lavishly want to offer them. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us, for all that you do for us, and for all that you will do for us in the future. We just praise you. We love you. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So let me start out by asking, why do we need friends? And uh, I'll give you a little bit of context. This will help those of you who are deciding whether or not you want to fall asleep or pay attention for the next couple of minutes. Um, we're going to talk about context. And what do I mean by context? When my son was in the sixth grade, he signed up for a class called um, Introduction to Technology. 
And a couple weeks into the class, he came home complaining. All they're teaching is how to use a keyboard and typing. And I said, dude, if you want to know how to productively use a computer, you have to know how to type. So context. You've got to learn the keyboard, then you can learn how to use the computer and use it most effectively. So when it comes to friends, let's talk about context. Why should you stay awake for the next 20 minutes? What's the big deal about friends anyway? Well, there are many reasons that we need friends, and here are just a few. First, unity and diversity in the body of Christ. One body, but many parts. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14 reads, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And the metaphor that I like to use is kind of like that of an orchestra. You know, in an orchestra, they're all playing according to one score. But it's many different instruments with many different parts. And to make sure that they're all playing in tune together, at the beginning of a performance, the first violin stands up, and every instrument in the orchestra tunes their instrument to the first violin. Jesus is our first violin. We're all tuning in to Jesus. Because, friends, we're designed to be interdependent and complementary to one another. None of us has all the gifts. None of us has all the skills. We all need each other in the body of Christ. Number two, two are better than one. You'll see in the Bible a lot that people are traveling in pairs. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. It's like this. With friends, our burdens are half as hard and our joy is twice as good. So travel in pairs. Two are better than one. The third reason we need friends is that we're blessed to be a blessing. In Acts 20, 30 through 34, it reads, You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Like the song said, you just might have a problem that all understand. We all need somebody to lean on. But when I don't ask you for help, I rob you of the opportunity to be a blessing to me. And when you don't ask me for help, you rob me of an opportunity to be a blessing to you. Friends were made to bless one another. So those are some of the big reasons why I, why you, why we need friends. Unity and diversity in the body of Christ, one body but many parts. Two are better than one because life is half as hard but twice as good when we travel in pairs. And we're blessed to be a blessing to one another. You to me, and me to you. Now in today's passage, with that context in mind, Jesus gives us a blueprint 
for how to be friends when he says, love each other as I've loved you. Love each other as I've loved you. It's really that simple and that complicated, right? So Jesus says, hey, look, I love you. I love you. But he's talking about love the verb, action, not just feeling like I feel love for you. He's talking about doing, putting love into action. And then he says, once you've received my love, and once you've experienced a love relationship with me, I want you to love others by action. Again, action, not just feeling. Love others the way that I have loved you. Pass it on. Spread it around like peanut butter lavishly. Go love others. Because when you have that love relationship with Jesus, you can't help but keep it to yourself. You want others to know about it. At least I can say, let me use I statements. I'm always telling my kids to use I statements. I want to share it with others. I want you to have the same excitement that I have. Because when I know what Jesus has done for me, man, I want to tell other people about that. Now, there are numerous examples of Jesus loving and being a friend in the Bible. In fact, we know Jesus had 12 close friends, the disciples. And the example that I want to highlight for you today is that relationship between Jesus and Peter. I love me some Peter. Simon called Peter was one of the first disciples that Jesus called. And they spent a lot of time together. We heard last week that you need to spend how many hours with somebody to be called a friend? A hundred. Y'all were listening. Very good. I'm going I'm to uh, just suppose that Peter spent more than a hundred hours with Jesus. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water toward the disciples in the boat, he said, Lord, if it's you... Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And Peter started walking on the water. And then he got excited and he took his eyes off of Jesus and he started sinking. And Jesus reached down and pulled him back up. God revealed Jesus' true identity to Peter. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus revealed Peter's true identity when he said, and I tell you that you are Peter. And Peter means rock. And on this rock, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Are you getting the picture? Jesus and Peter spent a lot of time together. Jesus and Peter helped and supported one another. It's safe to say that Jesus and Peter really knew a lot about one another. They were friends. But it's in the Garden of Gethsemane where we begin to get to the meat of their friendship. That's the place where Jesus starts to show me how to really be a friend by his actions. You see, it's in the Garden of Gethsemane where we read in Scripture that Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So it didn't surprise me when Jesus asked his friend Peter and two other disciples to keep watch while he prayed. This was his darkest hour. He needed some help from his friends. He asked his friends, come with me, keep watch while I pray. But you know, it did surprise me that when Judas greeted Jesus in the garden, in the NIV it says that Jesus replied, do what you came for, 
friend. Do what you came for, friend. But then again, Judas had also spent more than 100 hours with Jesus, and they were friends. And spoiler alert, there will be times when our friends let us down in our darkest hours. And then moving on, you know, it also surprised me when Jesus told Peter that Peter would deny Jesus three times before the rooster crows. Peter, I mean, Jesus, you first, you just told him, you're the rock upon which I'll build my church, and now you're telling me I'm going to deny you three times before the rooster crows? But what surprised me most, what surprised me most was what Jesus did after, after Peter denied Jesus three times. After being denied by his friend Jesus, Jesus responds by lavishly loving Peter. Jesus does what friends do. He loves. We pick up the story in John chapter 21. Early in the morning, Peter is out fishing with some of the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Jesus calls out to them from the shore, and here's that word again. Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they weren't catching any fish. So he says, throw your net on the right side of the boat. They did, and they were unable to haul in the net because it was so full. And then that's when they realized it's Jesus. And quickly they made their way to the shore. When they got to the shore, their friend Jesus had a warm fire for them and brunch. He had fish frying a warm fire, and the greeting of a friend. After they finished eating, Jesus and Peter had a little conversation. It's a very popular one. I know that many of you have heard it. But what is striking about that conversation is not only what was said, but what was left unsaid between these two friends. Jesus didn't say, Peter... Remember when you fell asleep on me three times in the garden? I mean, that's something I would have said, but Jesus didn't say that. Peter, remember when you fell asleep on me three times in the garden? Or, Peter, remember when I told you that you were going to deny me and you vehemently told me, there's no way, Lord, I will never deny you. And then, Peter, remember you denied me three times? Jesus didn't say any of that. Jesus simply asked Peter, do you love me? Not once, not twice, but three times. And each time Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And each time Jesus intentionally chose words to remind Peter of his identity and his calling. He said, Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, take care of my sheep. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, you're the rock. Follow me. You see, Jesus didn't choose to focus on Peter's faults. He chose to focus on Peter's future. Now, earlier this month, my dear friend Jesus and I, if you follow me on Facebook, um, we went up to Bend, Oregon for the week to spend some time together, just me and Jesus. But here's, I'm going to tell you guys a little story. If you are going to drive to Oregon, don't wait till 1 o'clock in the afternoon to leave. 
so that the last three hours you're driving on two-lane roads in the dark with snow flurries and little eyes on the side of the road. Because, I mean, yeah, I thought <laughs> this, I did not plan this too well. But anyway, I did arrive there safely, and I had a wonderful time. <clears throat> And I used Yelp, and I was just kind of going around the city and talking to different people. And when I travel, I like to ask the locals, this is your home. What do you like to do here? What's your favorite thing to do here? And I discovered a lot of wonderful things. One of the places that I discovered was Townshend's Bend Tea House. And Anita has a picture of it for you. I, I went into this tea house, and there was a barista there, and... He, I said, uh, I, I just want something a little sweet. And he started talking to me about this paleo dessert that had cacao. And I was like, that's it. Give it to me. Give it to me. And how, what am I going to pair it with? You know, because I had all these loose leaf teas. So I had coconut green tea. And I got my book and nestled into a corner. And uh, the barista said, I'll bring you your tea in just a minute. And when he walked up to me with my coconut green tea, he noticed the book that I was reading. It's called Love Does by Bob Goff. And he exclaimed, that's one of my favorite books. His name was Aaron, and he became a new friend. He came back out on his lunch, and we spent a half hour talking together about Jesus, friendship, love, and how friends do what love does. We talked about our favorite parts of this book, what made us laugh, you know, and I mean laugh out loud laugh where people are looking at you wondering what you're doing and they want to get in on it. And I shared with him one of my favorite quotes from the book. The quote is this, you know what it is about someone that makes them a friend? A friend doesn't just say things, a friend does. You know what it is about someone that makes them a friend. A friend doesn't just say things. A friend does. And then Aaron added, and Aaron was 29 years old. We're having this great conversation. He said, and you know what? Friends are comfortable with the brokenness in others. And they trust that the brokenness is not who they are but what they're going through. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's like, what? I said, I have to write that down. He goes, I'm quotable? I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, hold on, hold on. And I said, can I share that in my sermon? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, what's your name? Aaron Akbar. Aaron Akbar said this on April 13th. Friends are comfortable with the brokenness in others. And they trust that the brokenness is not who they are, but what they're going through. I said, man, that's Jesus and Peter in a nutshell. Jesus was comfortable with Peter's brokenness. Jesus trusted that Peter's brokenness, the falling asleep, the denial, and anything else he did, that's not who Peter was. Jesus knew that the brokenness, all those other things, was something that Peter was going through. And Jesus, our friend, chose to love Peter. He loved his, Peter, his friend Peter by looking beyond his faults and seeing his needs. Not only his physical needs, hey, you need to sit by the fire, you need to eat some fish, you need some sustenance. But he also spoke into his emotional needs and his spiritual needs. Jesus loved his friend Peter by offering him forgiveness and reconciliation. Yeah, 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 we got sideways but let's get back together. Let's reconcile. Feed my sheep. Follow me. Jesus loved his friend Peter by valuing his true identity. Peter, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're created in me to do good works, which I've designed in advance for you to do. Peter, I tell you that you are the rock on which I will build my church. 
Jesus loved his friend Peter by encouraging him and building him up. He didn't talk about his faults, all that stuff that had gone on. He simply said, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Follow me. Peter, rock on which I'm going to build my church. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. That's how Jesus loved his friend Peter. And that's how my dear friend Jesus loves me. And I'm so glad that he does. He looks beyond my faults. (laughs) And he sees my needs. And he says, Deanna, you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And when we get sideways, I forgive you. And I want us to be reconciled with each other. Spoiler alert, it's probably going to be an ongoing process because you're going to get sideways every once in a while. But Deanna, like if Jesus took my face in his hands, sorry about that, and he said, you're my beloved. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, and I've got stuff for you to do. Got you up at the hospital to be a chaplain. Stay in the game. I want to encourage you daily, and out of that encouragement that I give you, I want you to go love on others. I want you to go and encourage Norm, and I want you to go and encourage Anita, and I want you to go and encourage Erin, and I want you to go and encourage Jake and Joan, and I want you to go and encourage Dolly and Tom and Nancy, and I want you to love on others the way that I've loved on you. Pass it on with the hope that they'll pass it on. Love on others lavishly the way that I have loved on you. That's what friends do. Friends love. So two things as I close today. First, I have 12 copies of the book Love Does by Bob Goff, because I love it so much, and it's made me laugh, and laughter is good medicine. I want to pass it on. I'll be out in the courtyard giving them away for free. If you take one, I'd just like two commitments from you. One, that you'll read the book in the next 30 days, and two, that you'll pass it on. That's it. So come on out and see me if you want a copy of the book. You want to laugh till you pee in your pants. You will just love it. Uh, Read it, enjoy it, and then pass it on. But secondly, God may be stirring something in you today about friendship. Maybe God has placed someone on your heart as you think about this relationship between he and Peter, someone to whom you are called to be a friend. Maybe you're the one who needs a friend and you don't know where to turn to. Maybe you've been hurt before and your walls are up and you say, you know what, I've been hurt by human beings before and I am never going to let my walls down again. But the thing about it is, as long as your walls are up, hurt can't get in, but neither can love. It's a risk that we take, being loved. Maybe you don't have words for what you're feeling, but you just want to know that you're not alone. I love what it says in Matthew. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree on anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So as the worship team comes, they're going to start playing music just acoustically in the background. And while they play, The pastors, elders, friends, you don't have to have a particular title to pray for somebody. People who have a heart to pray are going to be coming to the altar. 
They're going to be available to you to listen to you, to love you, to encourage you, to be Jesus with skin on in this moment. We're going to be here to be your friend. We're going to be here to remind you that your brokenness is not who you are. Your brokenness is something that you're going through. That is not what defines you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made by God, designed to do good works that God prepared in advance for you to do. And we, as your friends, are going to stand with you and remind you of that. Now, if you need a touch from a friend today, it could be the most uncomfortable thing that you've ever done to stand up and walk to this altar. When I first started going to church, it was really hard for me because I didn't grow up in the church. You know, I wasn't a church kind of person. It's like, get up and go to the altar. Are you kidding me? Everybody's going to be watching. I don't know what I'm wearing today. How does my hair look? All that kind of stuff. Guess what? Nobody's thinking about you like that. Don't let what's going on in your mind keep you from getting to Jesus. So I'm going to ask the pastors to come right now and the guitar to play. And if you need a touch from Jesus, stand up. Take a risk. Stand up. Step out into the aisle and come. I'd come running down here every day if I could because I'm always needing a touch from Jesus. Don't be scared. We don't bite. We just want to love on you. Won't you come? <laughs>